I would uh, like to start by thanking IUGS and especially SA for putting on this uh, one wonderful event. Uh, today, I'd like to introduce you to the Archean rocks of the Eastern Beartooth Mountains. And this is one of the sites of some of the oldest rocks exposed and preserved in the world. And uh, it attests to the early crustal genesis, the formation of cratons, and then uh, the evolution of the cratons, and by extension, uh, addresses the question of when and how did plate tectonics begin. I would like to say my co-authors are Paul Miller from University of Florida and Daryl Henry from Louisiana State University, and we've been working in this area for uh, 40 or more years. So to start, the Beartooth Mountain, oops, I'm sorry about that. If I get the pointer, let me go back. There we go. To start, the Beartooth Mountains are part of the Wyoming Craton, one of many uh, cratonic areas of the world, including the Superior Province and the Kotval, Pilbara Cratons, and in other continents. I would point out that we have the advantage in the Beartooth Mountains that our exposures of Archean rocks are exposed in Laramide block uplifts that gives us a tremendous three-dimensional um, exposures. And here uh, on the right is a Google Earth I image of the Beartooth Mountains and, and the uplift. And we'll be talking today about specifically the eastern part uh, of the range. This is the uh, country where I work. And the important features here are these banded rocks on the cliffs in this particular area here. These are interlayered gneisses and uh, metasupracrustal rocks, things like quartzites and banded iron formations and, and related supracrustal rocks. And these are found as enclaves in a vast ocean of younger granitic rocks. So here we have a sketch map uh, of the area. And coming up the Beartooth Highway, up these very steep switchbacks on the road here, we've got four major areas where we have inclusions of pendants or screens of the ancient rocks in the younger uh, granitic rocks. This is what the outcrops look like in detail. And what we see is tectonic uh, interleaving of rocks like quartzites and iron formations. Here's that sulmonite bearing uh, gneisses. But they're tectonically interleaved with a variety of felsic gneisses uh, and, and tonalitic gneisses that we see here. We typically have to take the outcrops apart because they have been uh, undergone multi-phase deformation and metamorphism. And here we can see the interlayering of old gneisses dating back to 3.5 billion years, interlayered with intrusions of the younger granites uh, at 2.8 billion years. And let me just point out that in this single outcrop, there is a, a time span of over 700 million years uh, that reflects more than the entire Phanerozoic. Uh, squashed into one outcrop. And then we have a, a late mafic dike cutting across that as well. Looking at this in more detail, the main tool that we use to take apart these Archean rocks are zircons. And there's two types of zircons that are particularly important. The first is detrital zircons that we see in the quartzites. And the second is magmatic zircons. So let's take a look at this histogram on the left. And these are uh, zircons that uh, come from these quartzite layers, something like this. And I'll point out that we have zircons that date back almost to 4 billion years, and with peaks uh, at 3.7 and again 3.5 billion years, and a major uh, time of crust formation uh, starting at about 3.5 billion, but peaking at 3.3 to 3.2 billion years. And these are all zircons that are found in the quartzites as detrital zircons. This uh, little uh, zircon blip that we see here is uh, at 2.8 billion is uh, a zircon overgrowth related to the younger granites. Now, if we look at the gray gneisses, this is just one of many uh, Concordia plots that we have. And let me just point out that this age comes in at a, about 3.5 billion. And this is the age of intrusion of these uh, old gray gneisses. Now, this is a, a complicated diagram, and I'll reduce it to two arrows here. This first arrow here deals, uh, this is the epsilon hafnium 
uh, data from these zircons. And the important point here, as you get more and more negative, it means that you have more and more crustal recycling. So from 4 billion years to about uh, 3.6 billion years, it turns out that there are very few new additions uh, to the crust at this time, and it is a time of recycling of uh, probably mafic crust that was already here. Uh, and we believe that this was in a plume-related tectonic regime. But when we start seeing the gray gneisses come in at about 3.6 billion years uh, and younger to about 3.2, notice that the epsilon uh, hafnium values increase. This indicates new additions from the mantle. And the important point here is that this is what we believe to be the onset of subduction and the introductions of new crust coming up to form our cratonic uh, bodies. If we take a look at the metamorphism, just a couple of photomicrographs here, all these rocks have been metamorphosed in the upper amphibolite uh, to um, granulite phases, and we have uh, phases such as sillimanite, cordierite, here we have garnet clinopyroxene, and when we do a pressure temperature time path, it turns out that the supercrustal rocks had to be taken from the surface back down to metamorphic conditions of about six to eight kilobars, or depths of about 25 kilometers burial at temperatures of 750 to 800 degrees. They decompress uh, over time to give us a second amphibolite facies metamorphism. And this uh, thermal kick that we see right here, this is due to the intrusion of the granites at 2.8 billion years. Now, in terms of the geochemistry, there's a lot of information here, but let me just um, make a couple of general comments. When we look at the gray gneisses, they are primordial, they are dominantly uh, bimodal, where we have a mafic component and a silicic component. But when you look at the silicic component, they are dominantly sodic. They are not true granites. And so this is the so-called TTG, or tonalite trongemite uh, granodiorite suite, uh, producing the sodic granites in the first stage of uh, crust formation. If we look at the trace elements like rare earths, and if we take a look at uh, tectonic discrimination diagrams, the important points here is that these rocks formed under magma genesis by uh, subduction in the presence of garnet and hornblende. And so they were produced in a hydrated mafic crust due to subduction. If we look at the younger 2.8 billion year rocks, we see complex uh, uh, magmatic histories that you see here. These are rocks of now andesitic composition that are cut by true granites. And these rocks are of, vol uh, are of batholithic volumes. There are thousands of cubic kilometers of these later 2.8 billion year granites. And again, if we look at the uh, geochemistry uh, at this time, what we see is a complete calcalkaline suite going from basaltic to andesitic to diuretic to rhyolitic, rhyolitic rocks. We see enriched light rare earth elements. We see high field strength element depletion. And we see uh, tectonic environments that are similar to contemporary volcanic arc granites. And our conclusion is that this is uh, at 2.8 billion years, the result of the earliest calc truly calcalkaline magmatism, uh, the first andesitic rocks produced at this time based on uh, large iron lithophile and high field strength elements. And we believe that this is uh, evidence of full on contemporary st style plate tectonics by the late Archean. So in terms of scientific tradition, there's two points, thank you, um, almost done. One is, uh, has to do with the granite controversy, for, uh, articulated well by H.H. H. Reed, the question of where do granites come from? In the 1950s and 1960s, Ari Poldervart and his students from uh, Columbia University hypothesized that granites formed by solid state transformation in a process called granitization, that metasomatizing solutions pass through supercrustal rocks and transformed quartzites, oops, transformed, uh, get back, there we go, transformed uh, quartzites into uh, granites by these infiltrating um, solutions. 
More modern work by our group and, and others have shown through modern field and analytical studies that where Poldervart saw transformation, we see evidence of injection and partial assimilation. Uh, an interesting note is that we both agree that detrital zircons are really important. They use it as evidence of chemical resistors uh, in this transformation process, and we interpret the detrital zircons as inherited zircons in magmatic processes. The second thing is uh, when and how did uh, continental crust emerge, and when did plate tectonics form? And this cartoon on the right uh, shows the various stages. We believe that there was early extraction of mafic crust uh, from the mantle, uh, something like modern day um, oceanic platforms, that these rocks subsequently melted at about 3.2 to 3.5 billion years to produce the first uh, gray gneisses or soda granites. And then these rocks in turn were the platform to build uh, younger arcs at 2.8 billion years uh, in contemporary style plate tectonics. So why is this a first 100 geosite? Well, we believe that there's evidence of Archean crustal genesis and evolution that preserved um, a history in the geologic record going from about 4 billion to 2.8 billion years and evidence for the first uh, stages of late Archean plate tectonics. It's the site of one of the great debates in geology, where do granites come from? Uh, one of the great scientific uh, uh, controversies. The Beartooths are easily accessible on our Beartooth Highway. There's well-documented uh, geoscience for field investigations. And one of our um, correspondents in America has called the Beartooth Highway the most beautiful road in America. So please come out and visit us. Uh, thank you. And uh, I guess we're not doing questions, but thank you for your attention. Thank you, David.